while he was in Bethany. Take a shift. Because right now they're saying during, during this Passover festival that's taking place in Jerusalem, that Jerusalem has like three times as many people as it normally has in the city. It's, so it's, it's just super crowded. And so Bethany's a short distance away from Jerusalem. And how many know Bethany was kind of like Jesus' favorite place to go? There was something about Bethany, as you, as you read in the scriptures, there's something that his heart is in Bethany. He, he really loves Bethany. Why? Because of the people there. Who lives in Bethany? Lazarus, Mary, Martha, and <laughs> Simon the leper. <laughs> uh, there's, there's something about being in Lazarus' homes that, that's really interesting. And, and it seems like uh, the directors and writers of the Passion, or the Chosen, ha- has caught that. And they, they're developing for us in, in the series a, a glimpse of the relationship between Lazarus and Jesus. Those guys were good friends. He wasn't a disciple following Jesus, but he his heart was with Jesus, and Jesus really had a, a, a wonderful relationship with Lazarus. So there's something about Bethany. They, they love going to Bethany. So there he is reclining at table in the home of the man known as Simon the leper. Nothing like having a nice dinner. There he is, eating away with his, with his friends. And here comes a woman with an alabaster jar of very, very, very expensive perfume. And she opens it and pours it on Jesus' head, covers his whole body. A little bit of perfume sets the ambiance. A gallon of perfume, oh my, it's overpowering. And here's Jesus receiving this, not stopping her, allowing her the freedom to fully express what was in her heart to do. Some believe that this is Mary, Martha's sister, who lives in Bethany. Kind of makes sense. And here she is just pouring out. If it is that Mary, what do we know about her? She's the one that sits at the feet of Jesus in the midst of all the the busy details that need to be done she couldn't pull herself away to do all the little routine duties. She sat and listened. We we see her again in John 11, you know, and and after Lazarus has has died, and there she is, and she's grieving, and and, and Jesus comes to her, and she just knows that if Jesus would have been there, so did Martha. They both knew that if Jesus had been there, he wouldn't have died. And it's kind of in his encounter with Mary that we see that Jesus wept. So I think there's something special about Mary and her expression of love and affection that no doubt was even developed further in this expression as she's breaking this perfume and pouring it over Jesus. Does Mary know what she's doing? Does, Does she know that she's anointing Jesus' burial, his body for burial? We really don't know. I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Whether you call it feminine intuition or whether she just had an incredible awareness of discernment in the spirit, she knew that this was an expression that needed to be done that night. And she does it for Jesus. Now Jesus is is crucified very shortly. There's not a lot lot of time between this and his crucifixion and his placement in the tomb. We, We see that anointing the body for burial was part of the Jewish way of life. 
And so when we get to Easter and the resurrection story, the women are going with the spices to anoint Jesus' body for burial. Mary's already, she's, she's given something here that Jesus knows is in preparation for the cross, his death. So she broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. What an extravagant act. Hmm. I've just been kind of meditating on that and trying to understand what would that be like in your life and in my life? What would that kind of, of demonstration, outward expression of affection, of devotion, of of worship to Jesus, what would that look like? <clears throat> you might want to be thinking of that all through Advent and just inviting the Holy Spirit to reveal, you know, what is it that my heart wants to give expression to, to the wonder of the Messiah, the wonder of Jesus? <clears throat> Some of those present, though, we even get the negative stuff right there in this wonderful, wonderful expression. Why this waste of perfume? They're indignant about it. That's a nice way to say they are royally ticked off. They are enraged that such a waste was done. It could have been sold for more than a year's wages, which we've already attributed to and the money given to the poor. We always have a nice way, you know, when, when we want to bring a rebuke to someone, just put a little religious twist, you know, and you could have done that for the church, you know, or you could have done that for the poor, or you could have done that for the food pantry, or, you know, all those kind of, and they put that little, that little zinger in there. Could have given it to the poor. Hmm. And they rebuked her harshly. There wasn't anything gentle about it. There wasn't anything subtle about it. So what's Jesus do? He gets up and he speaks. Leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? <clears throat> she has done a beautiful thing to me. A beautiful thing to Jesus. So as you're meditating on the first part, add to your meditation. What's a beautiful thing? It kind of goes right in hand. What kind of extravagant way can I express myself? What's a beautiful thing that Jesus would perceive as something beautiful? Something beautiful. Done to him. Hmm. The poor you will always have with you. He's going to make a contrast between his presence with them and the poor with them. The poor will be with you. You can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. So here in chapter 14, as he's been preparing for his exit, his crucifixion, his death, his resurrection, once again, we see he's still on, he's still on point. He's still on track with what the Father's will is. You're not going to have me, but for a short time. 